Well, hey everyone. Welcome to episode 299 of F-Stop, Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week on the podcast, I was joined by Australian nature photographer and aerial specialist, Mika Boynton. You may recognize Mika's name from last week's episode with her partner, Matt Palmer. They co-manage a gallery together in Bright, Australia. Mika was also the winner of the Natural Landscape Photography Awards Abstract and Details category with an evocative, elegant, and thought-provoking aerial photograph. That photo will absolutely astonish you. Mika and I cover such a fun variety of subjects this week, including her passion for an area called the Kimberley, which is an area of Australia that has deep Aboriginal roots, and we discussed that at length. Before we start, I want to thank my friends David Kingham and Jennifer Renwick for putting together one of the coolest websites on the internet called Nature Photographers Network. It is a great platform for nature photographers and simply a wonderful community. The people there are very generous with their time and they offer amazing critiques for your photographs. People there also offer thoughtful comments on your images. They're really nice people and there's lots and lots of events happening all the time, almost weekly it seems, and it's a great value for your money. If you're into nature photography as much as me, for just $49 per year, you can join the community on NPN and gain access to these incredible benefits, which include access to fantastic articles, webinars, thoughtful critique, discounted tutorials, software, books, lots more. It's such a great place and I'd love to see you there. Just head over to npn.link forward slash f-stop to join. You can use the code f-stop10 for a 10% discount. That's npn.link forward slash f-stop. Okay, let's get to this week's episode with Mika Boynton. All right, Mika Boynton, it's great to have you on the podcast finally. I'm really honored to be invited. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, of course. I've been a huge fan of your photography for a long time. And of course, um, everyone I ever talked to from Australia is like, you got to talk to Mika Boynton. So here we are. Uh, really? Oh, I'm yeah. surprised at that. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think, you know, well, your work is amazing. So oh, I think there's lots of amazing photographers in Australia, but thank you. Well, that's true. You get y'all do have quite a few really talented photographers. It's kind of, it's kind of insane. It's a big country with not that many people. So, um, I yeah. think we're really lucky, particularly for aerial photography. Um, you know, there's a, yeah, a lot to go and photograph, which is awesome. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like, in the United States with the, the Southwest. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have all your aerial stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so for people that aren't familiar with you, which is probably Most quite a few people not in <laughs> Australia, I uh, would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself. So yeah, my name's Mika. It's a very strange name. It's mispronounced and misspelled all the time. Um, it's actually a nickname in Holland for Maria. My grandma's name was Maria, so her sister used to call her Mieke. And so, um, yeah, it's a Dutch name and it's spelled M-I-E-K-E, -E, which is really weird, but it's very normal over there. Um, I have, my mum's Dutch, obviously, but I was born in Australia, lived here all my life, um, got rallies in Holland, but, you know, I am definitely an Aussie. Um, I live in Bright in Northeast Victoria, which is a beautiful little town in the foothills of the mountains. We've got Mount Buffalo, Mount Hotham and Falls Creek nearby. And it might be surprising to some people, but we have snow, um, in, in winter in Australia. So we're right near the areas that get snow, which is awesome. Um, uh, my partner is Matt Palmer. He's a legend. Uh, I believe you will have released a podcast with him um, by the time this one comes out. He, yes. yeah, he's, um, he and I run a gallery, uh, which is most photographers dream, I guess. So I'm living the dream. Um, yeah, I didn't always, I wasn't always a photographer, obviously. So uh, in my yeah. past life, I've been an athlete and a teacher and a librarian. And yeah, what else? No kids. Um, what did you go to school for? Oh, that's a really good question. So I, I always loved art, but 
as my dad rightly pointed out, I didn't have the kind of talent that would um, enable me to earn an income from painting or drawing or anything. So he encouraged me to um, become better at another skill that I had, which was writing. So I studied literature and um, I actually did my university degree in the States um, in California. So I did creative writing, studied literature, came back to Australia and qualified as a teacher. So I taught English, drama and religion um, in high school for about four years and then taught um, primary school for a year in the Kimberley, which is what got me up to the Kimberley, which I'm sure is something we'll talk about because that's how I kind of yes. got into photography um, and then became a librarian after that. Brilliant. Okay. Well, geez, where do I even go from here? You, you gave me so many different entry points uh, to talk talk through different things, but uh, I want to go to I want to go back to um, to you said your you know your partner Matt Palmer. So yesterday, just yesterday, I had the pleasure of speaking with him, and I'd love to hear the story about how you two met and how you ended up together, both in your personal life and now in your business life. So Matt. Uh, Matt was part of an organization that unfortunately no longer exists called the Australian Institute of Professional Photography. And I knew of him because his photography is amazing, but also he worked with the AIPP. And um, I remember m meeting him twice, um, just briefly. He was a judge for the Victorian Awards one year and I met him briefly there and then he won Australian Photographer of the Year in 2019 which is absolutely massive and I went up and gave him a hug and I felt like I'd been kicked, kicked in the guts like I had a really um, physical response to him and I was like oh I better, better be careful with you <laughs> so I remember that but then we had nothing to do with each other we we did call each other a couple of times. Actually, the funniest thing was he called me because he was move, he, he decided to move to a different state and he was considering Bright, where I was living, as one of the options. And he rang me completely out of the blue and he said, how would you feel about another photographer being in your area, professional photographer? I was like, that's fine as long as you don't open a gallery. And I was legit, <laughs> I was legit about it because, um, I'd actually, I'd lived a lot of different places and I'd moved back here with the hope of opening a gallery because it's a, it, you know, it's the kind of town that would welcome a ga gallery and, but it's too small for two. So, right. yeah. So, right. <laughs> um, so that was another contact I had with him. And then what happened was during COVID, a lot of photographers, as you would well know, were really hugely impacted and were out of work and were wondering where they were going to, you know, get an income from. And it was all, it was really scary for a lot of, uh, of photographers. And because he was working with the AIPP, he set up a series of Q and A's. So um, just any photographer who was a member who was willing to have a chat with people, he set that up and it was a wonderful way of bringing the Australian photographic community together. And they were quite popular, this series. And um, I put my hand up, I was like, why not? But I was a bit, most people just, it was like a, a, a normal Q&A, but I wanted to be a bit more meaningful. And I talked about how sometimes the roughest parts of your life open the doors to the best part of your life. And I had had multiple experiences, one of them moving to America on a, on a scholarship and breaking up with my boyfriend at the same time, my parents going through divorce, it was really rough. Um, mm -hmm. Another one, when I was living the first year, I was up in the Kimberley, second year I was up in the Kimberley, I actually got attacked in my house, sorry to trigger anyone, but um, that was really oh, wow. scary. And, but what I was trying to say is that these horrible experiences, sometimes the best things come out of it. And were it not for that experience, those things wouldn't happen. So I was just trying to, I guess, say to people like this will pass and just hang in there because good may come of it. We don't know what good, but it might happen anyway. So I did this Q and A and I actually did two back to back and Matt was the moderator. 
And afterwards he messaged me and he's like, wow, um, if, if you need a debrief, I'm here to have a chat. If you don't, that's fine. Totally get it. And I was like, yeah, no, that sounds great. I'll go work, walk the dog and, um, and then I'll grab a wine and we'll meet back on Zoom. And we did. And we talked for 11 hours. Now, I have oh no God. idea what we said because 11 hours is a really long time. And <laughs> both of us were just like, okay, what just happened? So wow. this is during COVID, um, but we started talking quite regularly on Zoom and drinking lots of wine. And then <laughs> he said, I'm coming. So he was in Tasmania at the time. I was in Bright and he just hopped on the ferry and drove to my house and moved in. Wow. <laughs> I know it was pretty epic and no one's ever done anything that romantic for me. It was pretty awesome. Like, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So uh. that's how we met. And then, um, we were both doing separate jobs. So he was still working with the AIPP. I was running, uh, online workshops with zoom. I was running a lot of workshops to keep things happening during COVID. Yeah. And then we started talking about what we were going to do together and we both wanted to have a gallery. We both knew that from that previous experience. And it was just a matter of the right place coming up because a gallery really depends a lot on walk-in traffic and right. people won't go out of their way most of the time, unless they already know who you are. Uh, to go to your gallery so we really wanted it to be in town and we wanted it to people to be able to look in the windows not anyway this great location came up and i wasn't really ready for it to be perfectly honest i thought oh yeah next year right but we were both like this this is it we've got to do this um so we did and wow. yeah yeah, lots of nervousness over the past few years, but you know, sometimes you've got to take big risks. Um, if you, if you're the kind of people who can make it grounded, then it pays off. And you, and your gallery has been open now for just over a year. No, so almost a year. So the, um, almost 11th of December, it'll be a year. Huh. Yeah. That's my birthday. Oh, happy birthday for next month. See, we can both celebrate. We can. I'll cheers you. Oh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll have our little party and then I'll be happy birthday, Matt. Yeah, I'll be, I think I'll be in Argentina, but oh, anyway. Oh, awesome. Are you doing a uh, Patagonia trip or? No, no. I'm going to Antarctica. <gasps> oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah. It's oh, that's so be... exciting. Have you been before? Oh no. Like I've been to Iceland, Ireland, and Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. So yeah. That's it. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. This will yeah. be amazing with a group. Yeah. Obviously with a group. Yeah. It's kind of a long story, but, um, yeah, I'll, I'll fill you in later. Okay. <laughs> that sounds really exciting though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, happy yeah, birthday. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And happy, uh, anniversary to your gallery. Thank you. Yeah. So it's, it's funny. So with you and Matt Palmer, what little I know of each of you through interactions I've had with you online and over email and things like that, I can firmly say just from kind of gauging the two of you that you're very, very different personality wise. And so I'm super curious how that plays out in the day, in your day to day life and also just in running the gallery. Well, we might be a little bit different in personality, but we have the same values. And I think that's the most important thing. And I absolutely love his photography. He sees things that I don't. I actually had actively, I'd be, I was single for a long time before I met Matt. In fact, I hadn't been in a, you know, anything serious since 2005 before I met him over COVID. So it was a, you know, I was pretty, I was fiercely independent, really wasn't looking for anybody. Um, and I had, actively thought I can't be with another landscape photographer cause I'm too competitive because I am, I'm a competitive person. Sport was my background. Like it's just been yes. part of who I am for a really long time. And I was like, I don't want to be in a relationship where I'm competing. That just to me sounds like really bad news, but right. it's not like that with us because we see so differently. We see the world 
differently. We have the same values, we're the same on the inside, but our actual eyes see different things. So when yeah, we go- Yeah, you're very, your photography is quite different. Yeah, and when we go and shoot together, it's wonderful because we both enjoy that quiet, just being in our space, but being in each other's space without having to interact. And, and we come back, like our favorite thing to do when we, when we go traveling is each night we swap cameras or show each other our cameras and go through the photos that we took during the day because he'll see stuff that I don't, I'll see stuff that he doesn't. And we come up with really different photographs. And I love that. I'm so, like, I just never really thought that was possible. I thought everyone kind of saw the same stuff in landscapes but no it's not like that at all and his design background is something i have more of an art background he has more of a design background so like he'll be attracted to snow poles and dilapidated buildings and i'll be attracted to pure nature um and right. grand landscapes and you know it's it's quite different i'm learning yeah. i'm learning to see things differently from him and i'm sure you know, the, the opposite is probably true too, but like, I'll often see things. So I'll be like, Hey Matt, that's your shot. You know, um, I have no great desire to photograph it, but it's there and I can see it. Do you know what I mean? Totally. So that's really cool. And in terms of personality, he's quieter than me until you get to know him. Um, but he's not really a, I wouldn't classify him as a quiet person. He's just yeah. really chill. I probably am a little bit more um, energetic, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, yeah. I was telling him. I was telling him we should invite you to the Discord channel, and he was like, "If we did that, she would never get anything else done." <laughs> no, and I I actually have to put limits on social media because um, I my background is education and teaching and I want, I want to right. help people. You would just go, well, you I'd, would just I'd, constantly be doing it. Well, and, and people often ask me questions and then I feel like I need to give them the respect that they deserve and answer them fully. Uh, but what that means is I have to close off, uh, you know, from that kind of stuff occasionally, because otherwise I get, you know, people just don't really understand that you have a life. And so you get, you know, messages on Facebook or Instagram or whatever at one o'clock in the morning and people are waiting for a reply. And I have, I, I now have set up a auto response for when I just need space so that people know I've got the message, but I won't be responding straight away. I mean, I think that's healthy. There's, there's nothing wrong with protecting your time. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I, as a, you know, as we're saying, like, I just, I want to support people and want to help people, but that comes at a cost personally. So yeah, you just got to put a few limits on that. I totally get it. Um, so you guys are both, you both laid roots in the t small town of Bright, which is only has like 2,600 people. So why did you uh, decide to choose that particular location. So I, I think you're going to connect with this because you moved back to Colorado, right? After living in Oregon. So I okay. grew up here and w oh, when okay. I was a kid, um, I, I walked the mountains. I went to Mount Buffalo. I was in the, at the time Mount Buffalo had skiing. So I was in the Mount Buffalo ski school. Any, anyone who's local here who didn't know that will be like, what? Mount Buffalo had a ski squad. That's crazy. I was in the race team, which is hilarious because there was only one lift that had anything more than raceable. Yes. <laughs> right. Oh, and, and actually most of the time we did have some races that had, you know, like the little gate. So you push through and start the timer. And, um, but most of the time we actually did giant slalom where we became the poles. So, oh, right. uh -huh. you know, one person would go on ahead and then the next person would create the next pole. And, you know, um, because it, you just couldn't set up a racetrack permanently. It was, it's a really small mountain. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, so I, it's I, a, so it's just a place that you have deep, deep connections to personally. Yeah. And... My parents bought a cow paddock when I was about seven and created a winery. So my parents had, my dad was a, 
we came from a sheep farming family and he was horrified at how the farmer could put in so many years of work and then not have any say over the price of the final product that was determined by someone completely different and unrelated to the farming um you know just didn't know anything about the history or anything like that they just came up with a price and mum and dad were uh picking grapes in Alsace in France and dad had a light bulb moment that winemaking the winemaker has complete control over the whole process from the planting of the vines right through to the bottling of the wines and the distribution and, and how much you sell it for yeah all of that and so yeah. he actually went to Roseworthy Ag College and got his qualifications. We moved around a lot when I was a kid so that he could get great work experience in different wineries. Mum basically brought us up. She had three kids under four and he was gone most of the time. So hats off to mum, you know, she was just an absolute trooper. And of course being Dutch, like she didn't have the kind of network of family and friends that you would normally have. So my mum's just amazing. Anyway, so we, yeah, we started up the winery and as part of that winery, us kids, there were three of us, we were very much involved in it. So planting the grapevines, hoeing the weeds, um, right through to pruning, picking, um, moving wine around. So, uh, you know, I, I'd stand up on the barrels and have the, the tube in the barrel. And then when, you know, when I called out, there's, you have to shine a torch in to see when the wine comes up to the top. And then when it comes up to the top, you have to yell. So dad would stop the pump. Um, I was, we had a restaurant, so I was dish pig. Like it was, you know, I was very involved in that. And then of course I, I went away to boarding school, then went away to America for my rowing scholarship, then lived in the Kimberley, but I wanted to come back home. And I'm sure you connect with that. Like home is something, sure. yeah. If you've had that experience and I think particularly going to school with people, um, even the first few weeks that we opened the gallery, having people come in and say, oh, I haven't seen you since you were this high. That's really kind of special. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so awesome. yeah, I, I convinced him, I, can, I had to convince Matt to come here is what it is. And he's he was living in a, an amazing place in Tasmania that had beautiful views of the ocean, had little paddy melons who, who'd come and eat in his front yard and um birds and all sorts of stuff and so i did feel a little bit worried when he came here i was like oh i don't know if he's gonna really connect with this place um but he he loves mountains so the fact that we're living so close to three different mountains makes a big difference but that's why we're here because of me and my family that totally makes sense so Speaking of connection to place, um, you had mentioned uh, the Kimberley, and I don't think most people outside of Australia know what that is. So maybe tell us a little bit about the Kimberley region and then talk a little bit about um, what, why it means so much to you. So the Kimberley is a huge area up in the top left-hand corner of Australia. It's as, so, I used to have a little market stall there and it was crazy because you could have photos from the Kimberley from Broome and Kununurra, which are two different ends of the Kimberley. And that was just very normal. But they're as far apart as Sydney and Melbourne. And there's no way you could set up a market stall in Sydney and, sh and sell happily sell local photos of Sydney. And there's no way vice versa. So it, it is a gigantic area of Australia. And it's a place that has a lot of different Aboriginal groups, a lot of different Aboriginal cultures, and it's that they're very connected to country. It's one of the areas in Australia where there's very strong connection to country. So I went there as a teacher and that's how I got into photography. Basically that first year I went up with a point and shoot camera and took some terrible photos, but it was so beautiful that even my crappy photos looked okay and <laughs> right. i i shared my photos with obviously family and friends and uh, the the local people who i showed my photos to were quite impressed too so i was like maybe i'm onto something here you know so then my competitive spirit kicked in and i started being 
an active photographer instead of a passive photographer and trying to get cool shots. Uh, so that was the first year. And then I came back to Australia, to Australia, to Melbourne to um, re-qualify as a librarian. Uh, teaching and perfectionists don't mix well. So yeah, I, I really, so. I really struggled. Um, and, and I had, it was tough. I had 14 indigenous kids in my class and each of them had really significant personal issues that they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I found that really tough because I wanted to give them more than what I could. I, I wanted to be the counselor, you know, like I, I, but I, ha I didn't have those skills. So I found I, by the end of that year, I, I had nothing. I was so, the tank was empty. So I came back to Melbourne, uh, requalified as a librarian. My parents gave me my first DSLR. I headed back to the Kimberley. This time I went to the, so originally I was in Wyndham, which is in the east part of the Kimberley. And then I went back and lived in the west part of the Kimberley in a town called Derby. And I was there for two and a half years and I was very fortunate to get what at the time was my dream job. I was the uh, specialist librarian for the Kimberley Land Council. So I'm having experienced some of the more traumatic sides of uh, Aboriginal culture in the East Kimberley, I then got to meet some of the most incredible Aboriginal people through my association with the Kimberley Land Council. And I learned a lot about Indigenous Australia in that time. Um, but yeah, met some amazing people. And I think I'd gone there, I'd gone up to the Kimberley with stars in my eyes. Oh, these people are gonna tell me their stories and you know, it's gonna be amazing. And you know, the reality is these are real people with real three dimensional lives. It's, you know, like it's, it's just as bad to have that sparkle in the eyes idea about Aboriginal people as it is, you know, when people think that all Aboriginals are drunks. Like it's just as bad to have um, overly positive stereotypes as it is to have overly negative stereotypes because you're not seeing people, you're seeing ideas. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky to spend almost 10 years up in the Kimberley and it had a huge impact on my photography because I got to know places in a more spiritual way. I knew that the places that I was visiting there were people who knew that those places intimately, knew the stories, knew um, what had formed those places. There were places that you could just feel had presence. And it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a superficial thing. It was really quite meaningful, but also, so I, w I was very conscious right from the beginning that I wanted my photos to accurately showcase the amazing areas that I was seeing. So that was a huge impact on my work because I wanted to be authentic. Um, and once, once, what, just once I edited a photo, it was a photo of a Boab tree and I photographed it into the afternoon sun. And so the tree itself was a bit dark. And so I, I brightened it up, you know, I made it look really green and lush and beautiful. And I had this little kid come to my market stall and she was clearly an artist. Like she knew exactly what, what was what. And she picked up that photo and she turned it around to me and she said, this is a liar photo. And I was like, oh my God. She's like, this is liar. This isn't real. And I just was like, oh my God, I never want that to happen. I, you know, like she was just so, so straight out, you know, this isn't real. And, and I, I just, you know, it was a real thing for me. I was like, okay, I don't want that to happen. I want Aboriginal people to look at their country and be proud of what I've showcased, you know? So, um, yeah, that was, that was interesting. And in terms of visiting places, there's a lot said about if you go to a place that you're not supposed to go to, you'll get sick. Um, and I, I once was in a car with a university educated girl who was a little bit younger than me and we were just chatting and I said to her, you know, one thing that I really appreciate about, appreciate about Aboriginal culture is 
you don't go places you're not supposed to go. Like if someone said to me, you can't go there because it's men's business, you know, I'd be like, oh, I wonder what's there, you know, like, I, and I said, I, I just really respect that you have that respect for each other. And she laughed at me and I said, what are you laughing at? She said, you get sick. And she was absolutely legit convinced of this. And I, it just really made me stop and go, wow, this is, you know, this is real for people and we shouldn't go to places that we're not supposed to go. And the other thing that she said is if you go where you're not supposed to go and, and yeah, and you're not supposed to be there, the custodians of that place are the ones who can get sick. So, so when you say like a place you're not supposed to go, do you mean like some, some place that's spiritually yeah, significant for, for them? Yeah, or? there's some places that have, well, the Aboriginal people believe their dreaming ancestors live there. And if you go, you're supposed to sing, you're supposed to be welcomed. Um, if it's a waterhole, a lot of uh, cultures, you put a rock under your arm so that your sweat mingles with the rock and then you throw the rock into the water hole. That's hmm. that way you're announcing your presence to the spirit that's there. You know, it's, it, it, there's different things for different cultures, but it's hmm. all a respect thing. And so, yeah, there are places that you need to be introduced to. And this is the thing, like this is like having relationship with place. A lot of us talk about it because we intrinsically feel that, that presence of something and that, that desire to connect with that is quite strong. And for example, Mount Buffalo, my mountain here, I always had a a respect for it that I just didn't feel anywhere else, but I didn't understand what it was that I was feeling until I went to the Kimberley. And then I realized that's the feeling that I have for Mount Buffalo all the way over here, the other side of Australia. And there are other places that I've been that I feel that same spirituality, that, that presence that's more than just rocks and trees. Yeah, and no, I, t I totally know what you're talking about. I've I went on a trip in 20, I think it was 2018. I went to this area near Monument Valley called Hunts Mesa and you can only go up there with a Navajo guide and, you know, they drive you in and <clears throat> you stay there a couple of nights and, um, you have to kind of ask their permission to do, to go anywhere else up there. And I got, he came over to our group and he asked me if I wanted to go check out these arches and I was like, yeah, let's go. And I was the only one that wanted to go. So I got to hang out with him like for several hours and we just, he just taught me about his culture and, and when, and then I, and I got to, he was like, yeah, you can just walk around do whatever. Um, if you want to just walk back to the campsite, that's cool. He's like a couple of miles away. I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. And, and I, I know what you're talking about. I had a very spiritual experience there that I can't really put into words it's um but it was so impactful for me that i actually have a photograph Peace i took up there oh awesome tattooed on my arm so yeah it's um i totally know exactly what you're talking about yeah and i just think when you feel that um you 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 you've got to open yourself up to it you know and and be respectful and not walk somewhere that you know is gonna wreck stuff and not right. do you know like it, it just brings with it a whole heap of i know i should do this rather and right. to the point where i i <laughs> early on in the piece i went to a place called manning gorge and it's a spiritual place and i knew it was a spiritual place and there's rock art there and but i wanted to get i knew that there was a view from the top of a hill um where you're straight on to Manning Gorge and it's a massive waterfall cascades and I wanted to get the shot from there but of course that was off track and I knew I shouldn't but I really wanted to and I was like ah oh, well so I was climbing up um to get to it and I misjudged my weight and I went forward to try and grab something missed it and I fell back on my 
on my backpack. I felt oh, wow. completely on my back and winded myself. And I was like, I so deserve that. <laughs> you know, I yeah. knew I did it anyway, and I'm sorry. And that's the thing, like, I know it sounds really dumb, but y y there are places that I just feel they, they have a presence and they're interacting with you. And if you, you choose to ignore that at your peril, basically. Yeah. And on, when, the, on the flips, you know, I was <laughs> going to say on the flip side of that, paying attention to that, I'm guessing for you and a lot of other photographers that it can be quite transformative in terms of how you photograph that place and the types of things that you, that you're trying to say through your photographs of those places. Yeah. And I just think, you know, when you get those amazing experiences where the light is right and you just, you experience that all encompassing joy because you're seeing something really special, you kind of have that appreciation, that gratitude. And there are times where I actually out loud say thank you because it's just an incredible experience. And instead of it being just luck, it becomes something more meaningful. It becomes, a, a, and I know you can't control the weather. I'm not stupid, but you just feel grateful that that happened to you in that place, in that time. And there's no problem with gratitude. Like even if it's, bollocks and even if at the end of my life I look back and go oh my gosh you were so duped I don't care because I feel that and I feel it strongly and I'm willing to just accept it and not ask questions and just go yeah that's 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 how I feel about it but yeah the photos that I've taken in those places are special uh, because it's I think for both Matt and I photography is not just about the end product it's about the experience and particularly in my landscape photography, but also in my aerial photography, just the experience of the moment is more important than the photos. And I enjoy photography because it gives me a purpose to, to do those things and be in those places. But at the end of the day, it's actually the experience that I love the most. If I didn't have photography as a purpose, I probably wouldn't do any of the things that I do. So photography is very important. Don't get me wrong, but the experience is more important than that end result. Yeah, absolutely. You had talked earlier about your relationship uh, with the Aboriginal cultures uh, that are up there in the Kimberley. And I'm curious how that gets woven into your phot photographs at all. Well, it's just, it's, I, I don't know that there's anything visible, but it's just a respect for nature that is intrinsic. And I don't like to go off track too much. I, it, the desire to get an original photograph is not as strong as the desire to be respectful to the place that I'm in. There are certain places like in the highlands of Tasmania, where if you step on a certain plant, it'll take a thousand years for that plant to recover. Um, so that kind of awareness of nature is probably what I've ap appreciated most from learning photography in the Kimberley. And I just, I bashed about with a camera. Like I didn't have any training. I was just, making a lot of mistakes and looking on the back of my camera and going, Oh yeah, that sucks. Why, why does that suck? Um, I had an amazing experience. Uh, you've interviewed Christian Fletcher. So you know how much of an awesome guy he is. Um, I was at the point where I'd been photographing with my DSLR for almost a year and I just, there was no lessons, you know, I, there's no camera club there or anything like that. And I'd seen in this magazine that there was a, a workshop in Karajini, which is just south of the Kimberley, um, by about 10 hours, but it, you know, it, up there, just just, yeah, just in, up there, it's, it's, you know, the next area down. Um, and I'd seen in this magazine that there was a workshop with these three fellows and it was a bit expensive, but it was Karajini. I was like, awesome. They said, bring a laptop. I couldn't get one. So I rocked up not knowing any of the workshop leaders with my whole PC, the hard drive, the monitor, <laughs> everything. And I found out that they're three of Australia's 
best landscape photographers. So Christian Fletcher, Tony Hewitt and Peter Eastway. And the rest of the workshop participants were also incredible photographers. There were, I mean, some of these names might not be familiar to you, but um, Sheldon Petit, uh, Tanya Malkin, uh, Nigel Gaunt, Peter North, Australians will know some of these people, Robert Kuzveld, all these photographers that are just amazing. And then me, and I was green as a grasshopper. I had this tripod that was wobbly as, I had no clue. And <laughs> it was fantastic. It was amazing. I learned so much in that week. And yeah, that's a, it's the, the Pilbara where the, where Karajini is, is another place that you can really feel the presence um, of something else. There's a waterhole there that unfortunately is called Kermit's Pool because it's green, but I just think there's got to be a, a language name for that place. And I, I'm yet to find out what it is because there's three indigenous groups that, um, that are custodians for that area. But anyway, um, it, it, that is the most spiritual place I think I've ever been. I, I spent a good couple of hours there by myself once and time just stopped. It was amazing. But anyway, I'm diverging. Um, <laughs> I can't even remember where we started now. Oh, the, yeah. So uh, basically that experience of being up there has had a, a lasting impression on my photography just because that's how I learned photography mm -hmm. and yeah, but in terms of, you know, actual culture, well, I would say that because of my position with the Kimberley Land Council, I was lucky enough to meet people from different Aboriginal cultures, but you'd have to live there a really long time to get to know the cultures well. So I would not say I'm an expert on Aboriginal cultures. I just met some amazing people from different language groups and learned enough for me to really respect the cultures up there and their ongoing relationship to country that in some places goes back 60,000 years. Brilliant. Uh, what advice would you have for other photographers looking to establish a relationship with place and how do you think it will pay dividends uh, for their photography and personal growth. Yeah, I just, I just think that you should always be respectful and, and it, it's not necessarily to do with Aboriginal culture, but just being respectful to place. And I think the dividends are, you know, when you get those special experiences, it will resonate with you and you'll remember them for the rest of your life. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, switching gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, you recently uh, won the abstracts and details category for the Natural Landscape Photography Awards with your with a very stunning aerial photograph. Uh, first, can you tell us more about the photograph and what it means to you? So it's a it's a photograph just of a coastal place uh, at Gutharaguda Shark Bay in Western Australia, and. Gutharaguda means two waters and it's actually a bay where two waters meet and I was flying over that area. I'd heard so much about this area. It is one of the premier locations for aerial photography and there's a spot that it looks like there's a tree in the sea and it's beautiful tur turquoise water with white sand. It's really pretty and I had chartered a Cessna 207 I think it is or 152 I can't remember which one it was um, but I was <laughs> I couldn't get hold of a helicopter so I chartered a, a plane and Joe the pilot tried to make it as helicopter like as possible and he, you know when I'm shooting aerials I like to shoot straight down so he was fly flinging his aircraft around right and left so that I could shoot straight down and so he could, you know, do an orbit. So, and by the end of it, I felt sick as a dog and I've never had that reaction. It was all his flying, like, but the photos were amazing. Anyway, so this particular photograph, it actually sat on my hard drive for five years. Oh, wow. Um, I know that I saw this face because there are photographs of the tree in the sea 
and then there are like 20 photographs of her face. I know I saw it at the time. But then when I went through my photos, because I often didn't have time to process properly, when I went through my photos, I was looking for the tree because I remembered the tree and I, I just overlooked those photos. And then I was, I went back last year and I was looking through that folder for something else and her, her face showed up on my screen and it just took my breath away. And I was like, oh my God, look. And Matt was sitting just beside me in the office and I was like, Matt, Matt look. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And it really is incredible. It's, it's a woman's face and it's so in pro, almost in profile. She's got eyelashes, her eyes are closed. She's got lips um, and it's the most realistic looking face that I think you can get in nature. Um, and the significance of it for me is it's not just the beauty of this face. It's also that it's in an area that's quite well known for four wheel driving. And just like up in the Kimberley, there's a lot of turtles who nest in that area and some of them endangered turtles like the loggerhead and the four wheel driving causes massive problems because the four wheel drives go over the nests. The four wheel drivers have no idea. They know, they don't know it's there. Um, but they compact the soil and then the hatchlings can't get out. And so this is a real problem because turtles, they go back to the same spot to, ha to lay their nest and have their eggs. And so there are certain places that I think we should absolutely ban four wheel driving. There's so many places to go that don't need to be in areas where turtles nest. Um, but in my photo, her eyes have tire tracks over them. And it almost looks like her eyes have been sewn shut by tire tracks. And I find that particularly moving. So, you know, I don't expect, I feel like I'm really on my high horse this interview, but you know, everyone, everyone is a little different in their photography. Um, and I hope that people understand that this is just how I feel. I don't expect anyone else to um, come along for the ride with me, but it's, it's meaningful to me because I think she's saying something. And I'm really privileged that that photo won that category because her message is out there. Well, I don't think you should feel bad for having your photographs mean something beyond just, you know, a pretty rendition of a pretty thing. I think that's actually the goal that a lot of us have in our photography. And oftentimes it's not something that's attainable. So I think you should be pretty happy that you're able to Pull that off well i feel very privileged because i've gone back on google earth to look for her and i can't find her like i know where she is i know where she should be i can see the formation but you don't see a face anymore so huh. i feel very privileged that i got that opportunity so it's just a fleeting kind of situation where the conditions changed yeah, because they have tidal, you know, they have tides there. So the tides are always moving, shifting the sand slightly. So yeah, mm -hmm. she's not there anymore. Well, she's still lives in your photograph. Yeah. Lucky me. Um, well, which by so the way, no, I just want to flip that and say, this is yeah. an amazing competition and I'm so grateful to you guys for setting it up because I think there's a lot of photographers just like me who want their photos to honor nature and often in photography competitions it's much more about the skill of the processing rather than that showcasing of nature and i feel like this competition is more about showcasing nature and i love that i just think there's you know there's and clearly with your entries you you must know that there's so many photographers who are like yeah this is an awesome competition and really support it because of that no oh, thank you yeah we we didn't know how it would resonate, but we definitely felt like it would be something important to, to do. So I'm glad that at least a few people like it. A few more than a few, but yeah. <laughs> well, so I know that you do a ton of aerial photography. Um, would love to you, for you to talk a little bit about um, kind of the joy that that type of photography brings to you, because I think most people listening to you describe the plane flipping back and forth 
would probably kind of get the heebie-jeebies or be like, no, thank you. But I want to hear you talk about why you love that type of experience. Yeah, well, even as a kid, I just loved adrenaline. Um, I, I, when I was growing up, I did gymnastics because I loved doing somersaults and stuff. I did, I actually went on a diving camp and I learned to do somersaults and inward dives and, you know, scary stuff. Um, I did skiing. So I just loved that adrenaline. And then later on I did surf boat rowing. I don't know if you know that sport, but it's the sport of uh, surf lifesavers in Australia. And you basically hop in a big wide boat and you row out against the breaking waves. And then you turn around a, a buoy, we say in Australia, but you say buoy, and you come back towards the shore and you, you're rowing and then you catch the wave in the boat, which is incredibly dangerous. Um, so oh, it's really? really, yeah, so it's really thrilling. And then I did bobsleigh. So all of these things, I <laughs> just love the adrenaline and then it stopped, you know, I wasn't an athlete anymore and I was a teacher and I missed it. I missed that. I didn't, there was nothing in my life that gave me that thrill. And then I, um, I was on a workshop again with Christian Fletcher and part of that workshop was, a a flight over the in a helicopter over the East Kimberley mud flats. And I had that same excitement when I got in the helicopter, you know, like yeah. I'm you know, I'm flying and flying is not what humans do and this must be dangerous. Even though a pilot I've had multiple pilots tell me that you can't fall out of a helicopter. It's not possible to fall out of a helicopter. But you still like your natural physical response is a little bit that little frisson of fear. And I love that. So um so yeah, I went on this flight and look, the, the East Kimberley mud flats are intertidal and during the dry season, the whole area becomes formations that look like trees or branches and it's absolutely stunning. And so when I went on that first flight, I just was like, this is it, you know, it's that adrenaline, but it's also yeah. the beauty of nature you spread out below. Um, it's exciting. It's, it's really noisy. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't feel that same kind of connection that I do when I'm out photographing in the landscape. So it's a very different experience, but I love it just as much because it's, it, it's a whole different experience and it's exciting. Um, and there is that element of, of fear. And because of that, I just feel joyous. I just, it's exciting. Um, so I love aerial photography for that. And, uh, when you're flying in a plane, are you looking like through a window, through glass? So when you spend that much money chartering a plane or helicopter, you don't want to be shooting through perspex because there's big issues with that, mainly the reflections. Right. So sure. if you know, so basically I, whenever I fly, I charter uh, the helicopter or plane to either have doors off or a window to shoot through. Um, some of the Got planes, it. there's like a sliding door that you can shoot through. So, but yeah, it's for me now, it's not worth it if I have to shoot through Perspex because you just can't get the clarity that you need. That makes sense. And then, uh, not to get too in the weeds, but what's your kind of go-to lens setup for that? So I, I, I'll do the whole settings thing really quickly. So, but, um, I shoot primarily with my Nikon D810 and a 100mm macro. And the reason for that is, well, there's two reasons. Firstly, it's ultra sharp, it's very fast, and um, I can turn the focus ring till it doesn't go any further. And that's infinity focus. And that, as long as you're not getting too close to the ground, that works for everything. So I don't have to focus. I can just hold the focus ring as far as it'll go, sweet. Um, I have a second camera body with a 50 mil, that's just that little bit wider um, to get a bit of extra context if necessary. But I really like the 100 mil because it's just that little bit zoomed in from what you see. Um, and then what I do is I shoot aperture priority. I underexpose by a third of a stop and I set up, it's called um, ISO sensitivity. Um, Auto, auto ISO. Auto ISO sensitivity. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. well, no, not auto ISO. You set up, you set it up so that you set a minimum 
shutter speed and the maximum ISO. Right. And then your camera works within those parameters. So right. I set a minimum shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second and a maximum yeah. ISO of 3200. But that's right for my camera. You know, some cameras might not be. You sure. maybe want to set. But basically setting it up like that means I'm not thinking about settings. Yep. And it means yep. every photo yep. is sharp. And that that's, makes sense. yeah, that's what you want. You don't want to be thinking about camera settings while you're trying to compose because it's hard enough to get the compositions right. You don't want to be thinking about yeah, it, I did you a, know, changing stuff. I did a, a helicopter flight in Kauai. And, you know, when you're in a helicopter in Kauai, you get pretty close, you know? So I used my 21 um, F2.8 zeiss but it's a manual lens and same thing i just cranked it to infinity and i think i set it at f56 yeah that's um, what i shoot at and yep. then um yeah auto eyes so i think i did max 2000 and then my shutter speed was like one one twelve fifty, i think yeah so but yeah that sounds i was just curious because the plane's a little different because you're faster you're further away so that makes sense to use a, a hundred mil. Yeah, I still use that for helicopters too because helicopters are much more maneuverable and you can tell them to go up higher if you need to. Yeah, in Kauai, it's like you can't really do that. They have yeah, very okay. specific flight plans, but that makes sense. And the reason I don't use a wide is with a wide, you tend to get either the landing gear or the chopper blades in oh, the photo. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, with the helicopters you fly in, in Kauai though, it's, um, they're, just, they're pretty small helicopters. And um, at least the ones I've been on, their doors off, and you can compose without the the blades really easily. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's. Um, I I mean that was literally one of the most fun. Probably I guess it was probably like an hour and a half. I did it, and I was like, that was the most fun I've had in a long time. So. Yeah, most of my shoots are ninety minutes. I think that's the for me that's the sweet spot. Um, yeah. After yeah, that, yeah, yeah. it's I because it, it's full on. You know, especially if you're flying over things that you like shooting, um, you can take a lot of photographs in a very short space of time. And yeah. so after an hour and a half, it is quite taxing if you're yeah. shooting, you know, full on. So yeah, uh, your brain is done. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. can't do anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So kind of more along those lines, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about how this type of photography is different than the more traditional landscape photography. And I'm also wondering if you feel like it's somewhat of a cheat code to make good photographs. I don't know what you mean by that. Like, well, I mean, because the perspective is so different um, and you can get images that are very, uh, they're unique and they're surprising and they're, you know, it's very easy to get images. I think that are, um, that w when you first see them, you're like, whoa, right? Like, it's just immediately yeah, like, whoa, well, what's that? I think and whereas like traditional landscape photography, you know, you're going to have of probably gonna have some for like it's it's much easier to see like what what's going on you know what I mean I think I think when it when aerial photography first became more accessible I would agree with you just having that aerial perspective was enough for people to go wow but particularly in Australia where there are so many really amazing aerial photographers I mean there really are uh, yeah, Australia is <laughs> has some really exceptional aerial photographers here um it's not enough anymore to just have the aerial perspective and that makes it a lot more difficult because then what you're trying to do is involve elements of symbolism metaphor so something looks like something else. And mm. unless it's got that, it's just a picture. And so Australia, mm. I don't know if it's like this in the States, but in Australia, definitely, if it's just a pretty picture, it's not enough. It's like photographing the Grand Canyon. It's beautiful, but it's okay. You know, um, it's got to have that specialness, the special weather or the, so the specialness in aerial photography is, the elements of symbolism or metaphor that you can weave into it. So if a, sure. a 
pattern. It's all about abstract and that's what I really love about it. I've always loved abstract art. Some of my favorite artists growing up were Pete Mondrian, uh, Wassily Kandinsky, uh, I just, the op artists, I just, Escher, how he always, you know, oh, yeah. make, make, makes things look, the impossible things look possible. I love that. And that's, you know, what I loved before I became a photographer. And so finding that outlet where you can have abstract work that looks like or reminds you of something unrelated, but you clearly see it. I just think that's awesome. So I've got photographs that look like a tree, but it's not, it's just mud. I've got photographs that look sure. like bodies, but it's not, it's just sand. Um, that's where the challenge is. And particularly with aerial photography, when you're investing so much money in it, it's, it's expensive to For try sure. and get that added element in that 90 minutes is really challenging. So no, I don't think there's any cheating involved. <laughs> I think it's really quite difficult to get photographs, um, you know, that speak more loudly than the literal interpretation of the landscape. Yeah, no, that all perfectly makes sense for me. I mean, I do aerial photography myself, so I'm not trying to say like, it's, I love it. I think it's amazing. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say though, is, uh, like when you have uh, an amazing aer aerial photograph that's of a subject that no one's ever seen before and it has those qualities that you're describing, you know, it's got equivalence or it's got metaphor or all of those things. And then you, and then you show that alongside images that are just of a traditional landscape, those images of the traditional landscape, I think for most people, they're just not as interesting anymore, right? Like for the casual viewer, they're like, holy crap. I mean, that's why you see um, in a lot of the major competitions, like they're like, I think it's been a few years now, but I remember one year I went, I think this was maybe 2020. I looked at the winners for the Epson Pano Awards uh, out of the top 150 were aerial, right? Which is very unusual because you know that of the entries or it wasn't 50% of the entries were aerial, right? <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I'm just trying to say like, I think it's, um, I didn't mean you're cheating. I just mean that. Yeah, no, I understand. But I actually think people are becoming more accustomed to seeing aerials and therefore, um, it's, it's, yeah, my, my, I guess my Grand Canyon analogy still stands. It's this, it's, it's yeah. gotta be, you know, like we, We've seen it so many photos of the Grand Canyon that to to really speak to people now with a photo of the Grand Canyon, then the conditions have to be exceptional and it needs to be slightly different from the norm. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, in it's aerial, it's, it's elevated the game for sure. Yeah, and I, I think it's the same with aerial photography. I um, but I I hear what you're saying. I totally hear what you're saying. But you know, like in our gallery we've got some of my aerials and people are fascinated with it, but they're also fascinated with the straight landscapes. So I don't see that there, um, I don't see that there's a complete discrepancy between the value people place on um, aerial photography versus landscapes. And for me, it, the, res the response is very different. With my natural yeah. landscapes, I'm honoring a place. With my aerials, it's more about the art. So, and the artistry. So that it's yeah, different. It is different. And I think what's interesting about the two types of images too, is that I think when it, when it comes to art buyers, especially, you know, people tend to buy art that connects with them in some way, either because it, because the metaphor you're presenting to them speaks to them or because they have a connection to the place or the, the ephemeral nature of the image that you're, that you're selling. And I think that's where aerial photography has a disadvantage because people have a very hard time connecting to that place because it's unlike anything they've ever seen in person. But it's just like abstract art. It's yeah. because it's abstract, you're actually relying on color, form, uh, shape, pattern, texture to create an emotional response. And right. 
just like the abstract artists really struggled when they first were pushing out into the world with their abstract work and people were like, this is um, it's, oh, dang, we got a bleep. <laughs> but it's the same thing. You're trying to elicit an emotional response, but you're using a different language to what you're using in landscape photography. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, they're just so different, you yeah. know, like it's um, I'm not saying one's better or worse. I just it's interesting to con compare and contrast. Yeah, but I, I yeah, I, I love being an aerial specialist, but I would never be exclusively an aerial photographer because as we talked about kind of ad nauseum now, the experience of being in nature is so important to me. So I don't, yeah, I don't think, I, I think there are differences, but I don't think there's a better or worse. And I don't think there's a necessity to preference one or the other. Um, I think photography is big enough for all of us. I will say that, I mean, I think I sort of already implied this, but I will say that in my experience, judge, in judging that aerial images are much easier to impress a judging panel, at least, at least on the first pass of, you know, if you have a, if you're looking at 10,000 images and 10% of them are aerial, I, I bet you more than half of those aerial images are going to make it to the next stage just because of the Im immediate the immediate kind of like, oh, that's different. I've not seen that before. And that I'm going to, I would like to, I would like that to move forward. Whereas if it's kind of an average landscape photograph, that's probably not going to do, it's not going to make it past that. Right. Yeah. But I think that's a familiarity thing. And I think as time goes on, it will become much less um, of a preferencing thing because yeah, I think so. once you've seen a thousand photos of the braided rivers of Iceland, um, well, it's an incredible no, I, thing. I and the it. first time you see it, it's like, whoa, yeah, like, is that real? Yeah, exactly. Your mind just goes, whoa. Like, what um, the heck is that? <laughs> what is that? Why? What are the colors? You know, there's so right. many questions. Is it real? But once you've seen lots of them, then you start to look for different things. And it's the same with landscapes, you know, once I you've agree. seen enough waterfalls, it's like, well, what makes this special? Why is, why is this one? Like, because we all love waterfalls, right? Most people do anyway. And waterfalls yeah. don't do well in competitions anymore because it's got to be something extra. And I think, right. I think aerials are heading that same direction. And I'd, I'd, I remember I entered the AIPP awards. Um, actually, I think it was the year that Matt won and the judges were particularly harsh about aerial photography oh. and the previous year aerials had done really, really well. And uh -huh. then this particular year, I think it was Peter Eastway who said, we've seen this perspective so many times there needs to be something extra. And he was so dismissive and I got so upset. I was like, do you not know how hard it is to do aerial photography? <laughs> and of course he does know how hard it is to do aerial photography, but it's exactly what we're talking about. You know, it's familiarity. Yeah. If you're unfamiliar with aerial photography, then you're going to be impressed by the different perspective. But anyway, I think we've banged on about this enough. <laughs> no, it's, uh, well, I do have one more question related okay. to aerial photography. Yeah. Um, and, um, Basically, uh, my question is, what's your kind of approach to processing aerial work? Because I've noticed that many of your fellow countrymen and, and women um, who happen to be some of the world's best aerial photographers are generally very liberal when it comes to their processing approach of aerials, you know, drastically changing colors, adding colors, painting colors in that weren't there, like really pushing contrast and huge ways. Um, so I'm curious kind of what your approach is. Well, I kind of get that approach because it is abstract and it is artistic. And it's again, trying to use those very limited um, elements. So shape, color, pattern, texture to try and elicit emotion. So I can understand why people approach it in that way and are very happy to be liberal with their processing. But again, I think for me, because of my experience with the Kimberley, because of my attitude towards nature, most of my processing is trying to 
just show what I saw. And that actually involves a fair bit of processing just as a starting point, because when you're shooting, right. there's generally a bit of haze. You yep. have to touch the contrast, you know, otherwise it just looks really pale and flat. Um, yep. So, you know, there's, there is a necessity to process more with aerials than with your straight landscape shots. Having yep. said that, again, I just think nature is incredible and I, I predominantly just try to show that. But I also recognize that the artistic side of things in aerial photography is becomes more important and so yeah there are photos that i have that i can think of just off the top of my head where i've you know moved diagonals into a corner so that it's more pleasing or i've um shifted the color somewhat because it looked muddy or so i i completely get that that's a slippery slope um sure um but you know again i think it comes from a desire to show your artistry and communicate through those very limited elements uh, in a strong way. Brilliant. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. I mean, aerials are, especially if you're in an airplane, my understanding is like, I mean, I've seen the raw files there. Some of them are pretty bad, you know, it's just because there's so much haze and, you know, you just, you do have to kind of tease out a lot of the color that is naturally there. Um, and I have, definitely no issue with that i've just seen some pretty wild images where it's literally like a brown canvas of sand and then the end result you've got these yellows here and reds over here and oh look at these orange and green things over here and it's like okay <laughs> like, yeah and 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 i i think i think just with a photography across the board these days i think being honest about things is the most important thing and i'm very happy to say well this is a photo that i've done a lot of work to or this is a photo that's pretty much what i saw sure. um and i think at the end of the day photographers have every right to be artists and if For sure. aerial yeah, photography no, yeah and if aerial photography encourages that then great awesome yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> one of my favorite photographers who does a lot of that kind of work is Scott McCook. I mean, he's, but it's it's brilliant. Like, the end result is just beautiful, and I love it. So, I mean, I get it. I just, sometimes I'm yeah. like, I'm very shocked at the, at the transformation that occurs. Um, one of the artists that I'm going to rec recommend at the end, because I know you're going to ask, um, is Chris Saunders. And we've had some really interesting discussions um, because... For me, processing is a bit of a chore. I don't really enjoy it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I enjoy the shooting and the processing is a necessity. But yeah. for Chris, and this was really enlightening for me, for Chris, the processing is a really joyous and interesting experience for him. Sure. And so like I, I found that that really kind of opened my head to the fact that we all are a bit different. We approach things very differently and, and his work is exquisite. Oh my God. If you don't know his work, his aerials. Yeah. Oof. Seen it. yeah. Wow. Um, so yeah, I just think, yeah, each to his own. And I think as long as you're true to yourself and you don't, you know, say, well, this is exactly what I saw. And it's like, not um <laughs> then there's no, no you know it's it's just whatever your preference is yep 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 that all that all works for me all right uh shifting gears again um yesterday uh, matt palmer and i talked a lot about your the running of your gallery and i'm curious from your perspective what aspects that you enjoy and what are some of the aspects that you that you just dread well, if anything. the truth is, is all the stuff that I was dreading about starting my own gallery, I don't need to because most of them are Matt's strengths. So oh, we really? are like the perfect team. He, That's perfect. Yeah, it's just really fortunate. He likes the budgeting stuff. He likes, you know, keeping track of <laughs> stuff. He likes his stats. Um, I hate that stuff. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I find it really tedious. My, my math, my brain is an art brain, not a maths brain. And I find that really, I can do it, but I don't like doing it. 
Um, yeah. I don't enjoy that at all. I yeah. do like sharing the stories of the photos with people. And I do like, I mean, this is a, genuinely a dream come true. So yes, yes. having people walk in the door and want to hear about the photos and the stories and all the rest, that's just, it's just every day. I mean, even saying the words coming to work, it's like, ha <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, if I compare my situation now to when I was a miserable teacher because I just wasn't getting enough sleep and, you know, would put in so many extra hours and then some idiot would say, you're a teacher because you love the school holidays. I just, you know, I was just so miserable when I was doing that. And now, now I'm just happy, you know, I come in here and even when no one comes in the door, I get to process and do stuff um, that I, I mean, I, I do a lot of mentoring and, and things like that. And that's really enjoyable. So yeah, I, it doesn't get much better than this. So yeah, I'm very fortunate that the things that I'm not that great at Matt is, uh, because that way I don't have to do any of it. That's awesome. And you, and you guys are both still finding time to make to make new images too. Yeah, so this year we went to New Zealand to judge the Professional F Photography Awards over there and then we took extra time to crisscross the country all over the place chasing weather. Uh, we also went with Chris Saunders and another incredible photographer, Ricardo de Cuna, who I will also be recommending. Um, the four of us went to the Ikara Flinders Ranges in South Australia and it's very much an outback area. Um, and then we went up north to the Vulcatana Gammon Ranges. And so, yeah, we, we take trips. We're not getting out as much as we used to locally because it, you know, we, we're bound to the gallery and if there's no weather, <laughs> we're a bit spoiled. So we're not just going to go take photos unless it's going to be good really um which is a bit sad you know but like tomorrow is forecast for a bit of rain and actually a lot of rain we're actually right on flood um oh, yeah. watch here at the moment but the waterfalls are epic uh right. <laughs> so we might go do some exploring tomorrow but um but yeah we that's probably the, particularly for Matt I think that's the hardest thing for him is when he was living in Taz he used to go shooting at least once a week oh, and wow. uh -huh. here it's it can be you know a month between shoots for me it's a bit different I've got at least three years worth of photos on my hard drive that I haven't processed. So <laughs> I can just immerse myself in that and there's no issue. But for Matt, he processes very quickly. And mm. so he gets through, you know, a shoot and then he's ready for the next one. Whereas I, I don't operate like that. So I've got heaps. And if you, uh, if you've got downtime at the gallery, it's like, Oh, I guess I can just make process some photographs. Yeah definitely yep that's pretty sweet it is. <laughs> it is um well you know i think a lot of people fantasize about running a gallery um or opening a gallery what advice do you have for those individuals in terms of expectations planning and how it changes your life both positively and negatively if at all yeah, well, it definitely changes your life. Um, you are bound to a place and we're open six days a week. So uh, it definitely limits your photographic opportunities. So the first thing I would say is go get your photos. <laughs> like I've got three years worth of shooting on a hard drive and it's, it goes back further than that. But in the last three years, that's where the backlog really is, uh, particularly because when I decided to transition and become a full-time professional photographer, I took a year off and just shot. I went to Morocco. I went, um, oh, wow. uh, yeah, I, I went to, back to the Kimberley and took some photos. I, I went to the Blue Mountains. I, um, I went to Iceland, uh, you know, I had a huge photographic year. Uh, so opening a gallery with all that is great, but you know, in Matt, the, the opposite is what Matt's situation is, is that he hasn't got that, you know, that body of work 
sitting there waiting for him to look at. So I would say my way is better. Make sure you've got heaps <laughs> of photos and, um, and then, and then you, you know, you're not going to feel trapped. Uh, but in terms of the logistics and the, the, I guess the practicalities of having a gallery, you really need to have a strong body of work. You really need to have an extensive body of work. Uh, one of the things that we enjoy most is we change the whole gallery each season and we're coming up on Christmas. So this Christmas, we're actually going to just do all the ones we really have enjoyed most from the past year and just have a, a gallery full of our favorite images, I guess. But like, because bright is so seasonal, we had an autumn showcase, we had a winter showcase, we had a spring showcase and we want, we, I'm sure Matt mentioned this to you, but we want to have both local representation, but also work that we're particularly proud of, which is often from overseas, um, work that challenges people a little, hence my aerials, but also mm -hmm. some quirky stuff. He has such an eye for the quirky. Um, so that when you come into the gallery, it's not like, well, this is what I expected. I expected photos of the Northeast of Victoria and mountains. Um, you come into our gallery and there's just a little bit of everything. So you've got to have that because you're not going to be able to get that once you're in the gallery, really. Um, unless you, unless you can hire somebody to run it for you, yeah, but probably uh, not realistic for most people. No, not, not when you're of... just starting out and, and also in terms of business structure as soon as you employ someone there's a lot of extra stuff that comes into play so if you can avoid that for a little while and get your head around i mean just even the uh the software for accounting you know just getting your head around how all that works there, there's a lot of learning to do and of course i i do a lot of our printing so <laughs> I was just lucky, you know how you were talking about the panel awards that year with 50, it might have been 2019, which was when I won it. Um, so, oh, <laughs> so three of my aerials um, got me the gong that year, but also I got an Epson P77 24 inch printer from Epson, thank you, panel awards. And fortunately I was like, I want to embrace this and I want to sink my teeth into it. And so, um, yeah, 2019, I got this machine and started learning about it even though i didn't have a gallery and i had no um immediate plans to have a gallery and so by the time we opened the gallery i was all over it and i knew what i was doing but that printing oh my god that's a whole whole extra dimension if you're gonna compare uh, in terms of learning it's about as like when you learn your camera and then you learn how to use photoshop or or Lightroom, it's the same amount of learning involved for printing. Yeah, so, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm looking at your prints behind you. I mean, you clearly know a little bit about the involvement of making images that look great on your screen look great on paper uh, because they're very different. The, the, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, there's a lot of nuance. Yeah, there's sure. a lot involved. So, you can get all your stuff printed externally, absolutely, um, but it's going to cost a lot more and mm -hmm. you're also relying on, like you really need to make sure that your workflow is spot on because you want the prints that come back to look like what you've got on your computer. So right. yeah, there's a lot involved. And in terms of the gallery, we made sure that we were in a place that has good foot traffic. Because as I said, getting people in off the street um, is really important for a gallery. Yep. So that doesn't just happen quickly. You need to be looking for it usually for quite some time because right. it, it's crucial, it's make or break. If you get a, a location that's not ideal, you might have the most incredible photos ever, but no one will walk in the door people like to go to galleries when they're wandering around town <laughs> yeah there's a i live in a fairly tourist town myself um but like the spaces for that would that would even be suitable for a gallery are like 
four thousand dollars a month or something like that. I mean, it's it's insane. Yeah, there's a there. I, that's the other reason where why opening a gallery in Bright was important is because I don't think you could just open up a gallery in Melbourne, for example, and start making money. Um, it's expensive right. to set up. Just, I mean, here we had to paint everything. Uh, we put in a new floor, put in the lighting, um, put in partitions with the hanging system. You know, it's you, it's it's a lot up front. Yep. So you really got to know that you've got the location and the work to make it to make it work. But it's working, and I'm, uh, you know, I I hope I get to do this for the rest of my life, and there is a good possibility that that's going to be the case. So that's amazing. That is amazing. Well, Mika, it's been super fun. I have one more question and you've already started answering it, but who would you recommend our listeners learn more about here on the, sh on the podcast? So I've already mentioned two, so I'll re-mention them. So Chris Saunders, he's, um, he goes by 645 Imaging and Ricardo de Cuna, um, he's Ricardo de Cuna Images. He does some beautiful conceptual art and it's very thought provoking and very emotive. And uh, so his, his work is, is beautiful. Tanya Malkin is, I did mention her early on. She is a photographer that uh, lived up in the Kimberley while I lived up in the Kimberley. So we did a lot of shooting together and she's got some insane aerials. We went to Iceland together too. We, we were shooting there. Um, so her work is, is superb. Um, and she's got some absolutely beautiful landscapes too, particularly from the Kimberley. She's lived in the Kimberley a lot longer than me. So she's, you know, she, she knows a lot of areas and she has the same kind of respect for the Kimberley that I do. Um, and yeah, she, her work's incredible. Uh, I was going to recommend Jordan Cantelo, Weatherscapes. He's got some awesome Australian storm photography. Victoria Hark is a Canadian photographer. Her, I listened to her recently um, and she's just such a humble and down to earth person. She, you know, she's a Nikon ambassador and she's, her work's amazing. Yeah, and she's great. She was a, we had her on a panel here okay. a few years ago, but yeah, she's awesome. I'd love to have her, have her back. Awesome. And finally, um, Paul Hoyland, who is an amazing Australian aerial photographer. And I know that you've met him because he won one of the categories last year in the Natural Landscape Photography Awards. But he's he's a very deep thinking and um, engaged person and really fascinating to listen to. So they're my recommendations. Awesome. Well, Mika, this has been a lot of fun and uh, I just love your your awesome positivity and your approach and just really appreciate you bringing that to the show today. Well, it's honestly such a privilege to be invited and I'm very grateful and I hope that people have enjoyed listening. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you to Mika for the wonderful chat on the podcast today. I had such a great time. Your positivity is quite infectious and I think we could all use a little bit more of that in our lives these days. So thank you. I also hope you know that I really do admire your work and I can't wait to see where you take it next. As always, I'd love to hear back from listeners about anything that you enjoyed about this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please help us by leaving a comment or subscribing here on YouTube. It really does help. I appreciate you very much. Of course, the ultimate way to support the show is over on Patreon. It is a platform that we use to keep the show going. A small monthly or annual contribution goes a long way. At $5 per month, you gain access to a library of over 210 bonus episodes. And at $10 a month, you get access to the episodes earlier than the public. For example, I'm releasing this episode to the public on January 9th, but it was actually available on November 20th on Patreon. So check it out. Also with your Patreon support, you gain access to a private RSS feed that you can add to Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Google Podcasts, and pretty much whatever podcasting application you use, and it will automatically download the newest episodes and bonus episodes. Sweet. If you enjoyed Mika and I's chat this week, you can catch an incredibly fun bonus episode where Mika tells us all about her adventures as an Olympic athlete. 
Well, next week is a very special episode. It is our 300th. We have quite the surprise for you, and I can't wait to release it. That's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.